Cloche musket, wake kamtach musket, nice musket. I don't understand this musket, that is to say, how to use this musket. Here you have these words that have made their way down to the Columbia River and have formed the nucleus at the time of the trade language. So Clark, having come overland, could not and did not know the vocabularies that were published from the Captain Cook voyages, nevertheless recorded beautifully and accurately. I mean, it's a testimonial to his acumen as a scientist as well, I must say. This is an extraordinary object I'm sitting in front of. One of the journals of Lewis and Clark, whom President Jefferson, president in both senses, both of the APS and of the United States, sent on an exploratory expedition starting in St. Louis in 1804 and reaching overland the Pacific Ocean at the mouth of the Columbia River by the end of 1805. Here you had these two extraordinary individuals who were, in a certain sense, great scientists. And I mean that not just in terms of the collectinea of um, flora and fauna. When you read their notebooks, you realize they were, they were great social scientists in the making as well. They had a whole sense of the nature of interaction, of how people lived in various ways, what their cultural ecologies were like across North America. It's really quite stirring, I must say. It brought together two interests of mine that started to become very serious in college. One, the move to work on the indigenous languages of North America, which I had been introduced to in a course, but I started then making plans to start doing field work myself on one of the surviving languages, Chinookan, in fact, which is the family of languages along the lower part of the Columbia River that, in fact, Lewis and Clark brilliantly document. And the interest in a field which is called sociolinguistics, or the anthropology of language, um, of which language contact and the dynamics of contact are a key or prime example. I decided I wanted to do linguistics when I was uh, about 12. I, I remember um, finding a linguistics section in the, uh, in the public library and discovered this marvelous textbook, An Introduction to Descriptive Linguistics by H.A. Uh, Gleason, Jr. I couldn't put it down. It was like reading, a, you know, like reading the most gripping novel. I'd already been learning French in school, and I learned uh, Yiddish in school at an, a, a private um, after-school school to suddenly realize that there's something about all languages that one can study in a scientific way it was really uh, an extraordinary uh, extraordinary realization. Uh, it certainly um, determined where I went to college, because Harvard was the only place where you could major in linguistics as an undergraduate. In my second year, I discovered Native American languages, and that sort of clicked. This is, this is it, you know. In fact, I wrote a paper on this for Einar Haugen, who had just come to Harvard, great sociolinguist, and he was so interested in the paper that he said, we've got to revise this term paper and expand it and so forth. And indeed, it turned into one of my major publications. And it's an area that has propelled me also to look in other areas of the world. So I've also worked in indigenous Australia, for example, and have become interested now in globalization as a kind of phenomenon that even in our present day reveals phenomena like the phenomenon we see in the Clark Journal here. So this journal itself has had a remarkable life of 
trans transit, you might say, moving across the country and was gradually filled up. In this instance, the journal is one of Captain Clark. I first encountered this wonderful um, object in its uh, printed version when I was an undergraduate, suddenly discovering that two of my interests, an interest in Native American languages and my interest in the sociolinguistics of language contact came together in a remarkable passage of Clark's in December of 1805. Anyone who would be an objective biographer of my career would say, here's a central object of the APS collection which really formed something important in your career. And so we come to the Codex I, <laughs> journal of Captain William Clark from December 10th, 1805, where a Clatsop speaker, Clatsop Chinook speaker, speaks to Clark in the contact language Chinookwawa. We'll hear the entry of Clark's journal for Tuesday, 10 December, 1805. He describes an encounter with a, a Clatsop speaker uh, and then Suddenly there appears an important phrase, Tlush musket, wake kumtach musket. The other impressive thing about this, I must say, is the extraordinary evenness of the script. I'm, I'm amazed whenever I look at old documents of this kind to see the care with which people controlled their penmanship. Uh, something which is apparently no longer taught in most schools. It, it's extraordinary. Clark did not have an advanced education, but he obviously had a wonderful training in, as it were, neat, even, and clear writing that's really so extraordinary and extra extraordinarily impressive. Even his n numbers are, are beautifully rendered. Each figure, whether it's um, one that's supposed to go d below the line or above the line and so on and so forth. So it's really quite an extraordinary document. Physically, it's a beautiful document, I must say, uh, in so many ways.